Hello everybody and welcome to this month's edition of the Inspire Online Book Club. Um, I'm Claire Saribi and I'm one of the librarians at Inspire and I'm joined today by my colleague Anne who's also a librarian at, at Inspire and one of our regular readers Terry. So we're quite a, quite a, a select a group today but we're um, going to have a really interesting discussion I'm sure. So this month we have been reading The Doll Factory and um, Anne's holding it up which is a debut novel which is quite remarkable I think we'll get everyone else's opinion shortly but it's a debut by Elizabeth McNeil. So this book is set in the 1850s. It's against the backdrop of the Great Exhibition and the Pre-Raphaelite movement. And through the story, we follow uh, Iris, who's an aspiring artist. And we also follow another character called Silas. And he's a collector and a taxidermist. And as we follow them through Victorian London, the story builds, there's a lot of suspense. And I would really say it's, it's quite a thriller and um, it takes a more sinister turn. So you might have, um, realized that I really enjoyed it. I enjoy historical fiction and I do like a book with um, interesting female characters and I loved all the detail of the period but we'll come to Terry and we'll see. Terry how did you get on with the book? Quite captivating. I, you know we always say this I thoroughly enjoyed it but th there was so much wasn't there. It, it's dark, it's sinister um, it's a psychological thriller, but there's also the um, accuracy of the historical information as well. And as you just mentioned, there's Silas with, with his fractured mind. Um, the, the language is so, so rich. And at times, you know, I, I found myself reacting physically um, at, at some of the potently graphic language, uh, for instance, in the brothels mm -hmm. and, um, you know, the, the, the death of Albie. And, and, and then we've got um, the beauty uh, of art and, and culture uh, and the great exhibition, as you mentioned. And threading through all of this, uh, and I experienced it um, a little bit like a deadly spider's web. So threading through it all, we have the, the teasing by the author of Silas. Did he do it? Did he not do it? Mm. Tiny clues all the way along, you know, constantly reeling in uh, the, the, the reader, keeping us interested. Um, and the, the, you have the extremes of society, uh, those living are on the edge, um, prostitutes, the street urchins, and, and then at the other end of the spectrum, uh, we have art and culture. Uh, we have the pre-Raphaelite uh, brotherhood and um, their aspirations. And there's Iris. Now, I, I, I received Iris as a, a very young, timid, um, character initially when she was working in the doll factory, just painting uh, faces on China dolls. And yet she emerges, you know, there's a metamorphosis, isn't there? Um, she aspires to be an artist herself, uh, which is how she becomes involved with uh, Louis. And th there's also for her a sexual awakening, you know, this cosseted young girl um, almost overprotected by her family and herself being overprotective um, of her uh, sister. So enthralling. Um, one could, you know, write a book about it. <laughs> I think I agree with you, Terry. And one of the words that's come across in the reviews quite often has been Dickensian. And, you know, I think that's quite... Um, you know a claim to live up to but I think this book really 
does with the level of detail and um, historical setting and all the subplots and characters and imagery that's going on. And um, we'll come back to some of your comments in a minute. We'll just find out what Anne thought. Did you enjoy it, Anne? Um, yes, I also enjoyed it, which um, it wouldn't have been my first choice to pick, um, but I really, really did enjoy it because I found it was a very gripping read and actually extremely fast to read, which is interesting because, as everyone's mentioned, it's full of all lots of little details um, for example, just things about washing and sponges dipped in vinegar. And one thing that came across really well is actually the sense of smell, because I think in a lot of historical fiction, um, certainly on the television, things are a lot cleaner than they would have been. And people have beautiful teeth and um, clean hair and everything. And right from the beginning, there was this, a sense of smell um, with the scent of decay around Silas. And without spoiling um, the end, um, sewage actually plays quite an important part um, in this plot. And that's something most books will leave out. And I think it conveys a much more better sense of how the world would have been then um, with slums and Albie, the little child character we've just mentioned in passing, um, only having one tooth. Again, you know, lots of people would have had teeth problems rather than these beautiful gnashes that you normally see in television programmes. So it will be interesting. I think, Claire, that you found out that this has been option to be made into um, is it a television program or a film it's been picked up by the same production company that are doing it that have done marcella on itv so um yeah hopefully hopefully we'll they see. will be accurate in <laughs> i don't think they are. i think they'll make people beautiful but <laughs> <laughs> i do think part of the reason why i did enjoy it is because you did get a sense of the time um, and the period from it. And I will just say one last thing is, I couldn't believe this was the debut because you can usually, even if it's a really good debut, you can usually tell something as a debut. And this one, if I hadn't have known, I really, really could not have de uh, guessed there's a complete expertise in the writing here. And I actually would be very interested in um, reading a non-fiction book by her because apparently she did her dissertation in on Victorian clutter and I think a book on that would just be fascinating because um, that's how she's able to um, fill the book with so many interesting details but very very skilled writer. Well I think that's an interesting point that you finished on and um, so the author did write her dissertation on Victorian clutter and um, I mean there's a lot we can talk about here but let's start on the obsessive nature of Victorian collectors and um for me i think it's very significant that she chooses to um set this book very specifically in 1850 1851 with the exhibition you know the real pinnacle of i suppose um you know ingenuity and innovation and you know at the time the height of empire bringing all these collecting all these things from all around the world and putting them there in this great big glass palace and it really symbolizes the aspirations of the time and then we've got the aspirations of Silas with his museum his aspirations to um Iris we've got Iris's aspirations to become um a painter we've got Louis who wants to have his work at the Royal Academy on the line and then as you've both mentioned we've got young Albie whose great aspiration in life is to have have you know a set of teeth bless him and I think it really comes across in the book this obsessive nature of collectors particularly with um Silas so Terry do you have any thoughts on on that and the what's going on there with his collection well for him it is an obsession to own isn't it uh, whether it, it's a dead animal um, or um, a person uh, and his you know sexual fetish with um, redheads 
um, it, it plays a large part. And I would assume that his mother uh, was a redhead too. Um, so his obsession with collecting is far more sinister. And I, I believe that um, a lot of it is actually out of his control uh, because he was emotionally and physically abused by his mother. Um, so that he, he'll have a, a very strange outlook on relationships with women. And although he's almost split in that he, he presents as this um, most evil character, I was reminded of uh, Fagan in Oliver Twist. So, so with Silas and Alby, you've got Oliver and Fagan uh, or, or almost. Mm -hmm. But with, with Silas, it's, it's an uncontrollable urge to own and possess. He's desperate to be loved. So there's this side of him, um, his professional side, taxidermy, preserving things. And then he's almost childlike yearning to be loved and, and accepted because he's been ridiculed all of his life. Um, and the, the, the way that he uses the mice mm. to encapsulate uh, those that he wanted to love and wanted to be loved by. Um, and when we think of mice, you know, they're timid little creatures, aren't they? Uh, so yeah, an evil character uh, and yet an incredibly sad character. So I, I couldn't help feeling compassion for him. Yeah, I think that's really interesting about this book um, and how we view the characters and who deserves sympathy. And Silas, most definitely, is the villain of the piece. Mm -hmm. And yet, I think we've um, we we do get more depth with him than I think you do in a lot of books, and understand understand some of his. It's hot. You don't say you understand his motivations, really. But um, I do think you are able to look at things from his point of view a little bit, perhaps. I don't know. Would you say, Anne, that Silas is, deserves sympathy? You know, such an abhorrent character? No, that's a really tricky question, because I think... It she, this is why she's such a skillful writer because she does manage to portray a character um, with such skill that you do I do think you do understand why he's doing it I think it comes across that he doesn't really see in particular women as human he sees them as objects um, so and I think that becomes stronger throughout so in his mind he's living this whole fantasy world and he owns something so he deserves it so his um his thoughts are logical to him because it's missing that first step in seeing um people as having their own thoughts and motivations and I think this becomes clearer when um he almost has a bit of a break when Iris he gets to know her as a real person he doesn't actually like that real person because he's imagined her as um a fairy princess almost you know so um she is an item in his collection and when he comes up against reality um that causes even more problems so I don't know that I'd say he's, he's definitely not a likable character it's a very interesting character to read and I think that is the skill in that we can understand more because um she hasn't been didactic about it. She's managed to convey through um, showing, not telling, exactly why he's acting the way he is. Um, one point that um, I picked up on um, that's quite interesting is that the author presents Louis as a counterpart to Silas. They're like a reflection of each other. And um, she did that quite deliberate. And some of their actions and words in the book are very similar. So, for example, when um, Louis first meets Iris in the tea shop, he takes her wrists and he says, 
you know, I want you to be my queen, you know, um, and calls her Queenie. And likewise, when Silas accosts Iris at the Royal Academy of Art, he, he it's her wrist that he grabs and he says, you are my queen. And so um, I think that um, perhaps both men want to almost possess Iris um, but that the difference is that Iris obviously reciprocates Louis' feelings so I wondered if anyone had any thoughts on the relationship between Louis and Iris and do you think he's a good partner for her? I think he's um he could quite easily be a very misunderstood character um, because um, initially I, I thought, right, he, he's going to get this young model in his studio and um, have all, all, all manner of um, aspirations uh, uh, about her. Uh, and I do wonder whether it was Iris's or almost um, innocence, the simplicity of... Um, her, her outlook on life um, that, that kind of helped him to be attracted to her. Um, and, and as the relationship grows, she becomes much more than um, a, a, a model. Um, but, but because um, of his um, previous marriage and so on, he's constantly holding back, isn't he? Mm -hmm. um, so, so it's a very slow moving um, relationship which I think is beautifully done uh, as well and it's strange because he is a main character uh, and, and yet when, when I was thinking about my main characters um, he wasn't top of the list yeah, he sort of fades a little bit into the background, doesn't yes. he, really? I think Iris is more of a driving force. But yeah. I do think that he does enable Iris, particularly with her painting career. I don't know if you wanted to say anything, Anne? Well, it hadn't occurred to me before, but listening to the discussion and thinking about the mirroring, I suddenly thought that another way of the mirroring is that... Um, Louis gets to see Iris as a real person and gains respect for her as the real person because in the beginning he doesn't think he promises that he'll teach her to paint just to get her to model he doesn't think she's going to be able to paint but over time he gets to really respect her painting and um, sees her as a real person is actually even willing to compromise his thoughts and feelings long held for her which is the complete opposite of Silas so um and that hadn't actually occurred to me until now. But, um, yeah, I think that is a really interesting um, way that um, these videos are interesting because you can think of different things when speaking to other people. It brings new points to life. I think that um, one of the themes that runs through the book is freedom. And you've got literal freedom and you've got creative freedom. And I think that... Um, this is my take on things anyway I think that Louis allows Iris to have her creative freedom within the constructs of the time you know she becomes a successful artist and she you know achieves her dream whereas Silas he wants to use Iris for his creative you know purposes mm. he wants to capture her and an imprisoner like a butterfly really so I think that's quite quite interesting um, Anne's mentioned mirroring throughout the book and um, there's other examples that come up for example um, that uh, Elizabeth McNeil has chosen to make Iris a twin you know so we've got the direct count counterparts there and um, so perhaps we can talk a little bit about Rose because she's an interesting character so she is Iris's twin She's had this horrific experience with smallpox. And, um, you know, I went on a journey with Rose because I really disliked her at the beginning. And throughout the course of the book, I felt that, you know, um, I warmed to her. And, you know, the relationship between Iris and Rose 
um, was healed, was, you know, beginning to heal. So I don't know. Did you like the character of Rose, Terry? Um, yes. Uh, uh, again, she, she evokes great um, compassion. And yet uh, that there's this, um, uh, I feel this ambivalence towards her. Uh, because she's blaming her sister and the whole world for the fact that since having smallpox, you, you know, she it would be very unlikely that she uh, finds a suitor uh, 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 and so on. Um, but, you know, one can um, be compassionate um, towards her and try and imagine what it what would be like, particularly as Iris, um, Iris's art aspirations um, evolve uh, that you know there's this very successful sister so that there's always going to be a uh, sibling rivalry and um, the that you know studying twins is, is just so fascinating um, so uh, again another contrast um, uh, uh, against you know what one twin has uh, and what the other one doesn't but Iris is always mindful of her sister, isn't she? Mm. Um, you know, she wants to do her best for her and get her away from the doll factory um, with the proprietress who um, drinks laudanum but, uh, um, by the Lisa, not quite. But um, so, yes, a, a lot of respect for her. And uh, of course, in Victorian society, um, in within the uh, the culture where the girls were living, then it was you know the first aim was to find a suitor, wasn't it? You know, for parents that marry off the girls. Um, so yes, great, great compassion for her. Have you got anything to add about Rose? Um, um, not really about Rose, but mentioning her parents. I think her parents are possibly some of the least sympathetic characters <laughs> <laughs> in there. And it also makes me wonder that it's never fully explained. Um, Rose, we find out, has been blaming her sister for something it turns out she hasn't done. And it makes me wonder, we never really find out, but was it her parents um, mm. that uh, did the thing Rose has been blaming her sister for? But um, her parents are quite forgettable when Rose, um, when Iris escapes. Um, we never really hear any more about her parents. She's thinking about her sister, but not about her parents. So um, I think that's uh, quite an interesting thought. Mm. I think... Um... It really shows Iris's strength of character that she takes that leap and leaves the the uh, doll shop. And you can just get the the sense from the book how perilous her position is really. And you know, for example, you can look at the character of um, Bluebell and think an Albie's sister, and think you know she's really put herself in a position where she could have ended up you know having to turn to prostitution or be completely destitute like those I mean thankfully she she goes on and has um, a successful career and it's you know worth the risk but it just shows what she's prepared to put on the line for her dream really and what a strong dynamic character she is and I think that brings us um really to talk about the ending and um I think I'll come to Anne um what did you think about um how the book ends and how how Iris escapes the clutches of Silas were you expecting something mm -hmm. different that's going to be quite hard to speak about without necessarily having any spoilers. But what I think is interesting, um, yes, she sets it up. Um, Elizabeth McNeil sets it up to almost be a great rescue by Louis. And in the end, Iris actually rescues herself, um, which I think is a really nice, interesting change. 
But for me, again, I can see why the author has done it, but you have a bit of gap between Iris escaping and then there's just an epilogue. And as a reader, I kind of really wanted to know what happens in those bits. And I can see why she didn't write it, but it's like, I just want to know more. And that I think is a sign of a successful book that you want to know more and you're thinking about it. So um, it's uh, yeah, very skillfully written. How about you, Terry? Was the ending a surprise for you? Um, not really. A, a little disappointment in that I wanted to learn more about what happened to Silas mm -hmm. um, a, a, and how he would cope, as it were. Um, but, you know, that ending was a wonderful ending of hope, wasn't it? And so throughout the book, we've got the symbolism of the butterfly, uh, which is the symbol of hope. And um, so for Iris, then actually achieving one of her ambitions um, is, is a wonderful note to end on. But, but I would certainly want to read more of this author. Yeah, yeah definitely. And that, I think, will draw um, a discussion about the um the doll factory to a close there but it'll bring us nicely on to the fact that um elizabeth mcneil's latest book her second book has been published this month so um if you're listening and you enjoyed the doll factory then i can recommend circus of wonders by elizabeth mcneil it's set in the victorian era again um but this time it tells the story of now who's um, basically sold and kidnapped by the Jasper Jupiter Circus of Wonders and she does find fame with the circus but what at what cost and um, we have this available in hardback now in the libraries so do place a request and see how you get on with that so I think we all really really enjoyed the doll factory I think we could all read it again and um, there's so many layers and different um, paths you can go down with it I certainly want to find out more about um, that period and just very visual and conjures up all the all the images of those Victorian butterflies in a frame etc so um, yeah really great read so if you haven't read it do give it a go so uh, thank you very much to our panel today um, to Anne and to Terry all that's left to say is that we have chosen the book for June we're going to be reading The Shadow King by Maza Mangiste and this is a fabulous book it's had really rave reviews and um, the Times said unforgettable I suspect I won't read anything more moving this year and it was shortlisted for the Booker Prize last year it's set in Ethiopia at the start of um, well just before World War II in 1935 and it's on the brink of the invasion of Mussolini's army and what the book is about is African women um, who take up arms and their experience at war so I think there's going to be a really great read for everyone and um, I hope you'll join us next month thank you very much